You're listening to Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in Season 3 of Weekend Reads, we will be making our way through the 1922 abridgment of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. You can visit MidwestCovencast.com to find podcast extras, including a free online copy of the text. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on Patreon for access to additional materials, like a serialized official Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads ebook with additional notes about the text and some editorial modernizations straight from, well, me. Now, Coven, it is time to cozy up with your coffee or tea and enjoy this episode of Weekend Reads. Chapter 66 The External Soul in Folktales. In a former part of this work, we saw that, in the opinion of primitive people, the soul may temporarily absent itself from the body without causing death. Such temporary absences of the soul are often believed to involve considerable risk, since the wandering soul is liable to a variety of mishaps at the hands of enemies and so forth. But there is another aspect to this power of disengaging the soul from the body. If only the safety of the soul can be ensured during its absence, there is no reason why the soul should not continue absent for an indefinite time. Indeed, a man may, on a pure calculation of personal safety, desire that his soul should never return to his body. Unable to conceive of life abstractly as a permanent possibility of sensation or a continuous adjustment of internal arrangements to external relations, the savage thinks of it as a concrete material thing of a definite bulk, capable of being seen and handled, kept in a box or a jar, and liable to be bruised, fractured, or smashed in pieces. It is not needful that the life so conceived should be in the man. It may be absent from the body and still continue to animate him by virtue of a sort of sympathy or action at a distance. So long as this object, which he calls his life or soul, remains unharmed, the man is well. If it is injured, he suffers. If it is destroyed, he dies. Or, to put it otherwise, when a man is ill or dies, the fact is explained by saying that the material object called his life or soul, whether it be in his body or out of it, has either sustained injury or been destroyed. But there may be circumstances in which, if the life or soul remains in the man, it stands a greater chance of sustaining injury than if it were stowed away in some safe and secret place. Accordingly, in such circumstances, primitive man takes his soul out of his body and deposits it for security in some snug spot, intending to replace it in his body when the danger is past. Or, if he should discover some place of absolute security, he may be content to leave his soul there permanently. The advantage of this is that, so long as the soul remains unharmed in the place where he has deposited it, the man himself is immortal. Nothing can kill his body, since his life is not in it. Evidence of this primitive belief is furnished by a class of folk tales, of which the Norse story of the giant who had no heart in his body is perhaps the best known example. Stories of this kind are widely diffused over the world, and from their number and the variety of incident, and of details in which the leading idea is embodied, we may infer that the conception of an external soul is one which has had a powerful hold on the minds of men at an early stage of history. For folk tales are a faithful reflection of the world as it appeared to the primitive mind, and we may be sure that any idea which commonly occurs in them, however absurd it may seem to us, must once have been an ordinary article of belief. This assurance, so far as it concerns the supposed power of disengaging the soul from the body for a longer or shorter time, is amply corroborated by a comparison of the folk tales in question with the actual beliefs and practices of savages. To this we shall return after some specimens of the tales have been given. The specimens will be selected with a view of illustrating both the characteristic features and the wide diffusion of this class of tales. In the first place, the story of the external soul is told in various forms by all Aryan peoples from Hindustan to the Hebrides. A very common form of it is this. A warlock, giant, or other fairyland being is invulnerable and immortal because he keeps his soul hidden far away in some secret place. But a fair princess, whom he holds enthralled in his enchanted castle, wiles his secret from him and reveals it to the hero who seeks out the warlock's soul, heart, life, or death, as it is variously called, and by destroying it simultaneously kills the warlock. Thus, a Hindu story tells how a magician called Punchkin held a queen captive for twelve years, and would fain marry her, but she would not have him. 
At last, the queen's son came to rescue her, and the two plotted together to kill Punchkin. So the queen spoke, the magician fair, and pretended that she had at last made up her mind to marry him. And do tell me, she said, are you quite immortal? Can death never touch you? And are you too great an enchanter ever to feel human suffering? It is true, he said, that I am not as others. Far, far away, hundreds of thousands of miles from this place, there lies a desolate country covered with thick jungle. In the midst of the jungle grows a circle of palm trees, and in the center of the circle stand six chattis, full of water, piled one above another. Below the six chatty is a small cage, which contains a little green parrot. On the life of the parrot depends my life, and if the parrot is killed, I must die. It is, however, he added, impossible that the parrot should sustain any injury, both on account of the inaccessibility of the country, and because, by my appointment, many thousand janai surround the palm trees and kill all who approach the place but the queen's young son overcame all difficulties and got possession of the parrot he brought it to the door of the magician's palace and began playing with it punchkin the magician saw him and coming out tried to persuade the boy to give him the parrot give me my parrot cried punchkin then the boy took hold of the parrot and tore off one of his wings and as he did so the magician's right arm fell off Punchkin then stretched out his arm, crying, "'Give me my parrot!' The prince pulled off the parrot's second wing, and the magician's left arm tumbled off. "'Give me my parrot!' cried he, and fell on his knees. The prince pulled off the parrot's right leg. The magician's right leg fell off. The prince pulled off the parrot's left leg. Down fell the magician's left. Nothing remained of him except the trunk and the head, but still he rolled his eyes and cried, "'Give me my parrot!' "'Take your parrot, then!' cried the boy. And with that, he wrung the bird's neck and threw it at the magician, and, as he did so, Punchkin's head twisted round, and with a fearful groan he died." In another Hindu tale, an ogre is asked by his daughter, "'Papa, where do you keep your soul?' Sixteen miles away from this place,' he said, "'is a tree. Round the tree are tigers and bears and scorpions and snakes. On the top of the tree is a very great fat snake. On his head is a little cage, and the cage is a bird, and my soul is in that bird.' The end of the ogre is like that of the magician in the previous tale. As the bird's wings and legs are torn off, the ogre's arms and legs drop off, and when his neck is wrung, he falls down dead. In a Bengali story, it is said that all the ogres dwell in Ceylon, and that all their lives are in a single lemon. A boy cuts the lemon in pieces, and all the ogres die. In a Siamese or Cambodian story, probably derived from India, we are told that Thosakin, or Ravana, the king of Ceylon, was able by magic art to take his soul out of his body and leave it in a box at home while he went to the wars. Thus he was invulnerable in battle. When he was about to give battle to Rama, he deposited his soul with a hermit called Fire Eye, who was to keep it safe for him. So in the fight, Rama was astounded to see that his arrows struck the king without wounding him. But one of Rama's allies, knowing the secret of the king's invulnerability, transformed himself by magic into the likeness of the king, and going to the hermit asked back his soul. On receiving it, he soared up into the air and flew to Rama, brandishing the box and squeezing it so hard that all the breath left the king of Ceylon's body, and he died. In a Bengali story, a prince going into a far country planted with his own hands a tree in the courtyard of his father's palace, and said to his parents, This tree is my life. When you see the tree green and fresh, then know that it is well with me. When you see the tree fade in some parts, then know that I am in an ill case. And when you see the whole tree fade, then know that I am dead and gone. In another Indian tale, a prince setting forth on his travels left behind him a barley plant, with instructions that it should be carefully tended and watched, for if it flourished, he would be alive and well, but if it drooped, then some mischance was about to happen to him, and so it fell out. For the prince was beheaded, and his head rolled off, the barley plant snapped in two, and the ear of barley fell to the ground. In Greek tales, ancient and modern, the idea of an external soul is not uncommon. When Maligar was seven days old, the fates appeared to his mother and told her that Maligar would die when the brand, which was blazing on the hearth, had burnt down. So his mother snatched the brand from the fire and kept it in a box. But in after years, being enraged at her son for slaying her brothers, she burnt the brand in the fire, and Maligar expired in agonies as if flames were preying on his vitals again nisus king of megara had a purple or golden hair on the middle of his head and it was fated that whenever the hair was pulled out the king should die when megara was besieged by the cretans the king's daughter scylla fell in love with minos their king and pulled out the fatal hair from her father's head so he died in a modern greek folk tale a man's strength lies in three golden hairs on his head 
when his mother pulls them out, he grows weak and timid and is slain by his enemies. In another modern Greek story, the life of an enchanter is bound up with three doves, which are in the belly of a wild boar. When the first dove is killed, the magician grows sick. When the second is killed, he grows very sick, and when the third is killed, he dies. In another Greek story of the same sort, an ogre's strength is in three singing birds, which are in a wild boar. The hero kills two of the birds, and then coming to the ogre's house, finds him lying on the ground in great pain. He shows the third bird to the ogre, who begs that the hero will either let it fly away or give it to him to eat. But the hero wrings the bird's neck, and the ogre dies on the spot. In a modern Roman version of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, the magician tells the princess, whom he holds captive in a floating rock in mid-ocean, that he will never die. The princess reports this to the prince, her husband, who has come to rescue her. The prince replies, it is impossible, but that there should be some one thing or other that is fatal to him. Ask him what that one fatal thing is. So the princess asked the magician, and he told her that in the wood was Hydra with seven heads, in the middle head of the Hydra was a leveret, in the head of the leveret was a bird, and the bird's head was a precious stone, and if this stone were put under his pillow, he would die. The prince procured the stone, and the princess laid it under the magician's pillow. No sooner did the enchanter lay his head on the pillow than he gave three terrible yells, turned himself round and round three times, and died." Stories of the same sort are current among Slavonic peoples. Thus, a Russian story tells how a warlock called Koshay, the Deathless, carried off a princess and kept her prisoner in his golden castle. However, a prince made up to her one day as she was walking alone and disconsolate in the castle garden, and cheered by the prospect of escaping with him, she went to the warlock and coaxed him with false and flattering words, saying, My dearest friend, tell me, I pray you, will you never die? Certainly not, says he. Well, says she, and where is your death? is it in your dwelling? To be sure it is, says he, it is in the broom under the threshold. Thereupon the princess seized the broom and threw it on the fire, but although the broom burned, the deathless Koshi remained alive. Indeed, not so much as a hair of him was singed. Balked in her first attempt, the artful hussy pouted and said, you do not love me true, for you have not told me where your death is. Yet I am not angry, but love you with all my heart. With these fawning words, she besought the warlock to tell her truly where his death was. So he laughed and said, Why do you wish to know? Well then, out of love, I will tell you where it lies. In a certain field there stand three green oaks, and under the roots of the largest oak is a worm. And if ever this worm is found and crushed, that instant I shall die. When the princess heard these words, she went straight to her lover and told him all. And he searched till he found the oaks and dug up the worm and crushed it. Then he hurried to the warlock's castle, but only to learn from the princess that the warlock was still alive. Then she fell to wheedling and coaxing Koshay once more, and this time, overcome by her wiles, he opened his heart to her and told her the truth. My death, said he, is far from here and hard to find, on the wide ocean, and that sea is an island, and on that island there grows a green oak, and beneath the oak is an iron chest, and in the chest is a small basket, and in the basket is a hare, and in the hare is a duck, and in the duck is an egg, and he who finds the egg and breaks it kills me at the same time. The prince naturally procured the fateful egg, and with it in his hands he confronted the deathless warlock. The monster would have killed him, but the prince began to squeeze the egg. At that, the warlock shrieked with pain and turned to the false princess, who stood by smirking and smiling. Was it not out of love for you, said he, that I told you where my death was? And is this the return you make to me? With that, he grabbed at his sword, which hung from a peg on the wall, but before he could reach it, the prince had crushed the egg, and sure enough, the deathless warlock found his death at the same moment." In one of the descriptions of the Koshay's death, he is said to be killed by a blow on the forehead inflicted by the mysterious egg, that last link in the magic chain by which his life is darkly bound. In another version of the same story, but told of a snake, the fatal blow is struck by a small stone found in the yolk of an egg, which is inside a duck, which is inside a hare, which is inside a stone, which is on an island." Amongst people of the Teutonic stock, stories of the external soul are not wanting. In a tale told by the Saxons of Transylvania, it is said that a young man shot at a witch again and again. The bullets went clean through her, but did her no harm, and she only laughed and mocked at him. Silly earthworm, she cried, shoot as much as you like. It does me no harm, for know that my life resides not in me, but far, far away. And a mountain is a pond, and the pond swims a duck, and the duck is an egg, and the egg burns a light. That light is my life." If you could put out that light, my life would be at an end. But that can never, never be. However, the young man got hold of the egg, smashed it, and put out the light, and with it the witch's life went out also. 
in a German story, a cannibal called Body Without Soul or Soulless keeps his soul in a box, which stands on a rock in the middle of the Red Sea. A soldier gets possession of the box and goes with it to Soulless, who begs the soldier to give him back his soul. But the soldier opens the box, takes out the soul, and flings it backward over his head. At the same moment, the cannibal drops dead to the ground. In another German story, an old warlock lives with a damsel all alone in the midst of a vast and gloomy wood. She fears that being old, he may die and leave her alone in the forest. But he reassures her, dear child, he said, I cannot die and I have no heart in my breast. But she importuned him to tell her where his heart was. So, he said, far, far from here, in an unknown and lonesome land, stands a great church. The church is well secured with iron doors, and round about it flows a broad, deep moat. In the church flies a bird, and in the bird is my heart. So long as the bird lives, I live. It cannot die of itself, and no one can catch it. Therefore, I cannot die, and you need have no anxiety. However, the young man, whose bride, the damsel, was to have been before the warlock, spirited her away, contrived to reach the church and catch the bird. He brought it to the damsel, who stowed him and it away under the warlock's bed. Soon the old warlock came home. He was ailing and said so. The girl wept and said, Alas, daddy is dying. He has a heart in his breast after all child replied the warlock hold your tongue i can't die it will soon pass over at that the young man under the bed gave the bird a gentle squeeze and as he did so the old warlock felt very unwell and sat down then the young man gripped the bird tighter and the warlock fell senseless from his chair now squeeze him dead cried the damsel her lover obeyed and when the bird was dead the old warlock also lay dead on the floor in the norse tale of the giant who had no heart in his body the giant tells the captive princess far far away in a lake lies an island on that island stands a church in that church is a well in that well swims a duck in the duck there is an egg and in that egg there lies my heart the hero of the tale with the help of some animals to whom he had been kind obtains the egg and squeezes it at which the giant screams piteously and begs for his life but the hero breaks the egg in pieces, and the giant at once bursts. In another Norse story, a hill ogre tells the captive princess that she will never be able to return home unless she finds the grain of sand which lies under the ninth tongue of the ninth head of a certain dragon. But if that grain of sand were to come over the rock in which the ogre lives, they would all burst, and the rock itself would become a gilded palace, and the lake green meadows. The hero finds the grain of sand and takes it to the top of the high rock in which the ogre lives. So all the ogres burst, and the rest falls out as one of the ogres had foretold. In a Celtic tale recorded in the West Highlands of Scotland, a giant is questioned by a captive queen as to where he keeps his soul. At last, after deceiving her several times, he confides to her the fatal secret. There is a great flagstone under the threshold. There's a weather under the flag. There's a duck in the weather's belly, and an egg in the belly of the duck, and it is in the egg that my soul is. On the morrow, when the giant was gone, the queen contrived to get possession of the egg and crushed it in her hands, and at that very moment the giant, who was coming home in the dusk, fell down dead. In another Celtic tale, a sea beast has carried off a king's daughter, and an old smith declares that there is no way of killing the beast but one. In the island that is in the midst of the loch is Elid Tesfayan, the white-footed hind of the slenderest legs, and the swiftest step, and though she could be caught, there would spring a hoodie out of her, and though the hoodie should be caught, there would spring a trout out of her." But there is an egg in the mouth of the trout, and the soul of the beast is in the egg, and if the egg breaks, the beast is dead. As usual, the egg is broken, and the beast dies. In an Irish story, we read how a giant kept a beautiful damsel prisoner in his castle, on the top of a hill, which was white, with the bones of the champions, who had tried in vain to rescue the fair captive. At last, the hero, after hewing and slashing at the giant all to no purpose, discovered that the only way to kill him was to rub a mole on the giant's right breast with a certain egg, which was in a duck, which was in a chest, which lay locked and bound at the bottom of the sea. With the help of some obliging animals, the hero made himself master of the precious egg and slew the giant by merely striking it against the mole on his right breast. Similarly, in a Breton story, there figures a giant, whom neither fire nor water nor steel can harm. He tells his seventh wife, whom he has just married after murdering all her predecessors, I am immortal, and no one can hurt me unless he crushes on my breast an egg, which is in a pigeon, which is in the belly of a hare. This hare is in the belly of a wolf, and this wolf is in the belly of my brother, who dwells a thousand leagues from here. So I am quite easy on that score. 
a soldier contrived to obtain the egg and crush it on the breast of the giant, who immediately expired. In another Breton tale, the life of a giant resides in an old box tree, which grows in his castle garden, and to kill him it is necessary to sever the taproot of the tree at a single blow of an axe without injuring any of the lesser roots. This task the hero, as usual, successfully accomplishes, and at the same moment the giant drops dead. The notion of an external soul has now been traced in folk tales told by Aryan peoples from India to Ireland. We have still to show that the same idea occurs commonly in the popular stories of peoples who do not belong to the Aryan stock. In the ancient Egyptian tale of the two brothers, which was written down in the reign of Ramses II, about 1300 BC, we read how one of the brothers enchanted his heart and placed it in the flower of an acacia tree, and how, when the flower was cut at the instigation of his wife, he immediately fell down dead, but revived when his brother found the lost heart in the berry of the acacia and threw it into a cup of fresh water. In the story of Saif el Maluk, in the Arabian Nights, the Jinni tells the captive daughter of the king of India, When I was born, the astrologers declared that the destruction of my soul would be effected by the hand of one of the sons of the human kings. I therefore took my soul and put it into the crop of a sparrow, and I imprisoned the sparrow in a little box, and put this into another small box, and this I put within seven other small boxes, and put these within seven chests, and the chests I put into a coffer of marble within the verge of this circumambient ocean, for this part is remote from the countries of mankind, and none of mankind can gain access to it. But Saif el Maluk got possession of the sparrow and strangled it, and the jinni fell upon the ground, a heap of black ashes. In a Kabylie story, an ogre declares that his fate is far away in an egg, which is in a pigeon, which is in a camel, which is in the sea. The hero produces the egg and crushes it between his hands, and the ogre dies. In a Maguire folktale, an old witch detains a young prince called Ambrose in the bowels of the earth. At last she confided to him that she kept a wild boar in a silken meadow, and, if it were killed, they would find a hare inside, and inside the hare a pigeon, and inside the pigeon a small box, and inside the box one black and one shining beetle. The shining beetle held her life, and the black one held her power. If these two beetles died, then her life would come to an end also." When the old hag went out, Ambrose killed the wild boar and took out the hare. From the hare he took the pigeon, from the pigeon the box, and from the box the two beetles. He killed the black beetle, but kept the shining one alive. So the witch's power left her immediately, and when she came home she had to take to her bed. Having learned from her how to escape from his prison to the upper air, Ambrose killed the shining beetle, and the old hag's spirit left her at once. In a Kalmuk tale, we read how a certain Khan challenged a wise man to show his skill by stealing a precious stone on which the Khan's life depended. The sage contrived to purloin the talisman while the Khan and his guards slept, but not content with this, he gave a further proof of his dexterity by bonneting the slumbering potentate with a bladder. This was too much for the Khan. Next morning, he informed the sage that he could overlook everything else, but that the indignity of being bonneted with a bladder was more than he could bear, and he ordered his facetious friend to instant execution. Paid at the exhibition of royal ingratitude, the sage dashed to the ground the talisman, which he still held in his hand, and at the same instant blood flowed from the nostrils of the Khan, and he gave up the ghost. In a Tartar poem, two heroes named Akmalat and Bulat engage in mortal combat. Akmalat pierces his foe through and through with an arrow, grapples with him, and dashes him to the ground, but all in vain. Bulat could not die. At last, when the combat has lasted three years, a friend of Akmalat sees a golden casket hanging by a white thread from the sky and bethinks him that perhaps this casket contains Bulat's soul. So he shot through the white thread with an arrow, and down fell the casket. He opened it, and in the casket sat ten white birds, and one of the birds was Bulat's soul. Bulat wept when he saw that his soul was found in the casket, but one after the other the birds were killed, and then Akmalat easily slew his foe. In another Tartar poem, two brothers, going to fight two other brothers, take out their souls and hide them in the form of a white herb with six stalks in a deep pit, but one of their foes, seeing them doing so, and digs up their souls, which he puts into a golden ram's horn, and that sticks the ram's horn in his quiver. The two warriors whose souls have thus been stolen know that they have no chance of victory, and accordingly make peace with their enemies. In another Tartar poem, a terrible demon sets all the gods and heroes at defiance. At last, a valiant youth fights the demon, binds him hand and foot, and slices him with his sword. But still the demon is not slain. So the youth asked him, "'Tell me, 
where is your soul hidden? For if your soul had been hidden in your body, you must have been dead long ago. The demon replied, On the saddle of my horse is a bag, and the bag is a serpent with twelve heads. In the serpent is my soul. When you have killed the serpent, you have killed me also. So the youth took the saddle bag from the horse and killed the twelve headed serpent, whereupon the demon expired. In another Tartar poem, a hero called Kok Chan deposits with a maiden a golden ring, in which is half his strength. Afterwards, when Kok Chan is wrestling long with the hero and cannot kill him, a woman drops into his mouth the ring, which contains half his strength. Thus, inspired with fresh force, he slays his enemy. In a Mongolian story, the hero Joro gets the better of his enemy, the Lama Shoradong, in the following way. The Lama, who is an enchanter, sends his soul in the form of a wasp to sting Joro's eyes, but Joro catches the wasp in his hand, and by alternately shutting and opening his hand, he causes the Lama alternately to lose and recover consciousness. In a Tartar poem, two youth cut open the body of an old witch and tear out her bowels, but all to no purpose. She still lives." On being asked where her soul is, she answers that it is in the middle of her shoe sole, in the form of a seven-headed speckled snake. So one of the youths slices her shoe sole with his sword, takes out the speckled snake, and cuts off its seven heads. Then the witch dies. Another Tartar poem describes how the hero Cartaga grappled with the swan woman. Long they wrestled. Moons waxed and waned, and still they wrestled. Years came and went, and still the struggle went on. But the piebald horse and the black horse knew that the swan woman's soul was not in her. Under the black earth flow nine seas. Where the seas meet and form one, the sea comes to the surface of the earth. At the mouth of the nine seas rise a rock of copper. It rises to the surface of the ground. It rises up between heaven and earth, this rock of copper. At the foot of the copper rock is a black chest, and the black chest is a golden casket, and in the golden casket is the soul of the swan woman. Seven little birds are the soul of the swan woman. If the birds are killed, the swan woman will die straight away. So the horses ran to the foot of the copper rock, opened the black chest, and brought back the golden casket. Then the piebald horse turned himself into a bald-headed man, opened the golden casket, and cut off the heads of the seven birds. So the swan woman died." In another Tartar poem, the hero pursuing his sister, who has driven away his cattle, is warned to desist from the pursuit, because his sister has carried away his soul in a golden sword and a golden arrow, and if he pursues her, she will kill him by throwing the golden sword or shooting the golden arrow at him. A Malay poem relates how, once upon a time, in the city of Indrapura, there was a certain merchant, who was rich and prosperous, but he had no children. One day, as he walked with his wife by the river, they found a baby girl, fair as an angel. So they adopted the child and called her Bidasari. The merchant caused a golden fish to be made, and into this fish he transferred the soul of his adopted daughter. Then he put the golden fish in a golden box full of water and hid it in a pond in the midst of his garden. In time, the girl grew to be a lovely woman. Now the king of Indrapura had a fair young queen, who lived in fear that the king might take to himself a second wife. So hearing of the charms of Bidasari, the queen resolved to put her out of the way. She lured the girl to the palace and tortured her cruelly. But Bidasari could not die, because her soul was not in her. At last, she could stand the torture no longer, and said to the queen, "'If you wish me to die, you must bring the box, which is in the pond in my father's garden.' So the box was brought and opened, and there was the golden fish in the water. The girl said, My soul is in that fish. In the morning you must take the fish out of the water, and in the evening you must put it back into the water. Do not let the fish lie about, but bind it round your neck. If you do this, I shall soon die. So the queen took the fish out of the box and fastened it round her neck, and no sooner had she done so than Bidisari fell into a swoon. But in the evening, when the fish was put back into the water, Bidisari came to herself again. Seeing that she thus had the girl in her power, the queen sent her home to her adopted parents. To save her from further persecution, her parents resolved to remove their daughter from the city. So in a lonely and desolate spot, they built a house and brought Bidisari thither. There she dwelt alone, undergoing vicissitudes that corresponded with the vicissitudes of the golden fish, in which was her soul. All day long, while the fish was out of the water, she remained unconscious, but in the evening, when the fish was put into the water, she revived. One day, the king was out hunting, and coming to the house where Bidasari lay unconscious, was smitten with her beauty. He tried to waken her, but in vain. Next day, towards evening, he repeated his visit but still found her unconscious. However, when darkness fell, she came to herself and told the king the secret of her life. So the king returned to the palace, took the fish from the queen, and put it in water. Immediately, Bidasari revived, and the king took her to wife.
Another story of an external soul comes from Nias, an island to the west of Sumatra. Once on a time, a chief was captured by his enemies, who tried to put him to death, but failed. Water would not drown him, nor fire burn him, nor steel pierce him. At last, his wife revealed the secret. On his head, he had a hair as hard as the copper wire, and with this wire, his wife was bound up. So the hair was plucked out, and with it, his spirit fled. A West African story from southern Nigeria relates how a king kept his soul in a little brown bird, which perched on a tall tree beside the gate of the palace. The king's life was so bound up with that of the bird that whoever should kill the bird would simultaneously kill the king and succeed to the kingdom. The secret was betrayed by the queen to her lover, who shot the bird with an arrow and thereby slew the king and ascended the vacant throne. A tale told by the Baranga of South Africa sets forth how the lives of a whole family were contained in one cat. When a girl of the family named Titishan married a husband, she begged her parents to let her take the precious cat with her to her new home, but they refused, saying, you know that our life is attached to it, and they offered to give her an antelope or even an elephant instead of it but nothing would satisfy her but the cat. So at last she carried it off with her and shut it up in a place where nobody saw it. Even her husband knew nothing about it. One day, when she went to work in the fields, the cat escaped from its place of concealment, entered the hut, put on the warlike trappings of the husband, and danced and sang. Some children, attracted by the noise, discovered the cat at its antics, and when they expressed their astonishment, the animal only capered the more and insulted them besides. So... They went to the owner and said, There is somebody dancing in your house, and he insulted us. Hold your tongues, said he. I'll soon put a stop to your lies. So he went and hid behind the door and peeped in, and there, sure enough, was the cat prancing about and singing. He fired at it, and the animal dropped down dead. At the same moment, his wife fell to the ground in the field where she was at work. Said she, I have been killed at home but she had strength enough left to ask her husband to go with her to her parents' village, taking with him the dead cat wrapped up in a mat. All her relatives assembled, and bitterly if they reproached her for having insisted on taking the animal with her to her husband's village. As soon as the mat was unrolled, and they saw the dead cat, they all fell down lifeless, one after the other. So the clan of the cat was destroyed, and the bereaved husband closed the gate of the village with a branch and returned home, and told his friends how in killing the cat he had killed the whole clan, because their lives depended on the life of the cat. Ideas of the same sort meet us in stories told by the North American Indians. Thus, the Navajos tell of a certain mythical being called the maiden that becomes a bear, who learned the art of turning herself into a bear from the prairie wolf. She was a great warrior and quite invulnerable, for when she went to war, she took out her vital organs and hid them so that no one could kill her. And when the battle was over, she put the organs back in their places again. The Quaquidal Indians of British Columbia tell of an ogress who could not be killed because her life was in the hemlock branch. A brave boy met her in the woods, smashed her head with a stone, scattered her brains, broke her bones, and threw them into the water. Then, thinking he had disposed of the ogress, he went into her house. There he saw a woman rooted to the floor, who warned him, saying, Now do not stay long. I know that you have tried to kill the ogress. It is the fourth time that somebody has tried to kill her. She never dies. She has nearly come to life. There in that covered hemlock branch is her life. Go there, and as soon as you see her enter, shoot her life. Then she will be dead. Hardly had she finished speaking, when, sure enough, in came the ogress, singing as she walked. But the boy shot at her life, and she fell dead to the floor. Chapter 67 The External Soul in Folk Custom Subsection 1 The External Soul in Inanimate Things Thus the idea that the soul may be deposited for a longer or shorter time in some place of security outside the body, or at all events in the hair, is found in the popular tales of many races. It remains to show that the idea is not a mere figment devised to adorn a tale, but is a real article of primitive faith, which has given rise to a corresponding set of customs. We have seen that in the tales of the hero, as a preparation for battle sometimes removes his soul from his body, in order that his body may be invulnerable and immortal in the combat. 
With a like intention, the savage removes his soul from his body on various occasions of real or imaginary peril. Thus, among the people of Manasseh and Celibus, when a family moves into a new house, a priest collects the souls of the whole family in a bag and afterwards restores them to their owners, because the moment of entering a new house is supposed to be fraught with supernatural danger. In southern Celibus, when a woman is brought to bed, the messenger who fetches the doctor or the midwife always carries with him something made of iron, such as a chopping knife, which he delivers to the doctor. Doctor. The doctor must keep the thing in his house till the confinement is over, when he gives it back, receiving a fixed sum of money for doing so. The chopping knife, or whatever it is, represents the woman's soul, which at this critical time is believed to be safer out of her body than in it. Hence, the doctor must take great care of the object, for were it lost, a woman's soul would assuredly, they think, be lost with it. Among the Dyaks of Pinoe, a district of southeastern Borneo, when a child is born, a medicine man is sent for, who conjures the soul of the infant into half a coconut, which he thereupon covers with a cloth, and places a square platter or charger suspended by cords from the roof. This ceremony he repeats at every new moon for a year. The intention of the ceremony is not explained by the writer who describes it, but we may conjecture that it is to place the soul of the child in a safer place than its own frail little body. This conjecture is confirmed by the reason assigned for a similar custom observed elsewhere in the Indian archipelago, in the Key Islands. When there is a newly born child in a house, an empty coconut, split and spliced together again, may sometimes be seen hanging beside a rough wooden image of an ancestor. The soul of the infant is believed to be temporarily deposited in the coconut, in order that it may be saved from the attacks of evil spirits. But when the child grows bigger and stronger, the soul will take up its permanent abode in its own body. Similarly, among the Eskimo of Alaska, when a child is sick, the medicine man will sometimes extract its soul from its body and place it for safekeeping in an amulet, which for further security he deposits in his own medicine bag. It seems probable that many amulets have been similarly regarded as soul boxes, that is, as safes in which the souls of the owners are kept for greater security. An old Mangangje woman in the West Shire district of British Central Africa used to wear around her neck an ivory ornament, hollow and about three inches long, which she called her life or soul. Naturally, she would not part with it. A planter tried to buy it of her, but in vain. When Mr. James MacDonald was one day sitting in the house of a Hlubi chief, awaiting the appearance of that great man who was busy decorating his person, a native pointed to a pair of magnificent ox horns and said, Tame has his soul in these horns. The horns were those of an animal which had been sacrificed, and they were held sacred. A magician had fastened them to the roof to protect the house and its inmates from the thunderbolt. The idea, as Mr. MacDonald, is in no way foreign to South African thought. A man's soul there may dwell in the roof of his house, in a tree, by a spring of water, or on some mountain scour. Among the natives of the Gazelle Peninsula in New Britain, there is a secret society which goes by the name of Ingniet or Ingiet. On his entrance into it, every man receives a stone in the shape either of a human being or of an animal, and henceforth his soul is believed to be knit up in a manner with the stone. If it breaks, it is an evil omen for him. They say that the thunder has struck the stone, and that he who owns it will soon die. If nevertheless the man survives the breaking of his soul stone, they say that it was not a proper soul stone, and he gets a new one instead. The emperor Romanus Lecapenus was once informed by an astronomer that the life of Simeon, prince of Bulgaria, was bound up with a certain column in Constantinople, so that if the capital of the column were removed, Simeon would immediately die. The emperor took the hint and removed the capital, and at the same hour, as the emperor learned by enquiry, Simeon died of heart disease in Bulgaria. Again, we have seen that in folk tales, a man's soul or strength is sometimes represented as bound up with his hair, and that when his hair is cut off, he dies or grows weak. So the natives of Amboina used to think that their strength was in their hair and would desert them if it were shorn. A criminal under torture in a Dutch court of that island persisted in denying his guilt till his hair was cut off, when he immediately confessed. One man, who was tried for murder, endured without flinching the utmost ingenuity of his torturers till he saw the surgeon standing with a pair of shears. On asking what this was for, and being told that it was to cut his hair, he begged that they would not do it, and made a clean breast. In subsequent cases, when torture failed to wring a confession from a prisoner, the Dutch authorities made a practice of cutting off his hair. 
here in Europe. It used to be thought that the maleficent powers of witches and wizards resided in their hair, and that nothing could make any impression on the miscreants so long as they kept their hair on. Hence in France it was customary to shave the whole bodies of persons charged with sorcery before handing them over to the torturer. Malaeus witnessed the torture of some persons at Toulouse, for whom no confession could be wrung until they were stripped and completely shaven, when they readily acknowledged the truth of the charge. A woman also, who apparently led a pious life, was put to the torture on suspicion of witchcraft, and bore her agonies with incredible constancy, until complete depilation drove her to admit her guilt. The noted inquisitor, Sprenger, contented himself with shaving the head of the suspected witch or wizard, but his more thoroughgoing colleague, Cumanus, shaved the whole bodies of forty-seven women before committing them all to the flames. He had high authority for the rigorous scrutiny since Satan himself, in a sermon preached from the pulpit of North Berwick Church, comforted his many servants by assuring them that no harm could befall them. So long as their hair was son and should neuter lat and tear for fraud their end. Similarly, in Bastar, a province of India, if a man is adjudged guilty of witchcraft, he is beaten by the crowd, his hair is shaven, the hair being supposed to constitute his power of mischief, his front teeth are knocked out, in order, it is said, to prevent him from muttering incantations. Women suspected of sorcery have to undergo the same ordeal if found guilty, the same punishment is awarded, and after being shaved, their hair is attached to a tree in some public space. So among the Beals of India, when a woman was convicted of witchcraft and had been subjected to various forms of persuasion, such as hanging head downwards from a tree and having pepper put into her eyes, a lock of hair was cut from her head and buried in the ground." that the last link between her and her former powers of mischief might be broken in like manner among the aztecs of mexico when wizards and witches had done their evil deeds and the time came to put an end to their detestable life some one laid hold of them and cropped the hair on the crown of their heads which took from them all their power of sorcery and enchantment and then it was that by death they put an end to their odious existence subsection two the external soul in plants Further, it has been shown that in folk tales, the life of a person is sometimes so bound up with the life of a plant that the withering of the plant will immediately follow or be followed by the death of the person. Among the Mbengas in Western Africa, about the Gaboon, when two children are born on the same day, the people plant two trees of the same kind and dance round them. The life of each of the children is believed to be bound up with the life of one of the trees, and if the tree dies or is thrown down, they are sure that the child will soon die. In the Cameroons, also, the life of a person is believed to be sympathetically bound up with that of a tree. The chief of Old Town in Calabar kept his soul in a sacred grove near a spring of water. When some Europeans, in frolic or ignorance, cut down part of the grove, the spirit was most indignant, and threatened the perpetrators of the deed, according to the king, with all manner of evil. Some of the Papuans unite the life of a newborn babe sympathetically with that of a tree by driving a pebble into the bark of the tree. This is supposed to give them complete mastery over the child's life. If the tree is cut down, the child will die. After a birth, the Maoris used to bury the navel string in a sacred place and plant a young sapling over it. As the tree grew, it was a tohu oranga, or sign of life for the child. If it flourished, the child would prosper. If it withered and died, the parents ogred the worst for the little one. In some parts of Fiji, the navel string of a male infant is planted together with a coconut or the slip of a breadfruit tree, and the child's life is supposed to be intimately connected with that of the tree. Amongst the Dayaks of Landak and Tajan, districts of Dutch Borneo, it is customary to plant a fruit tree for a baby, and henceforth in the popular belief the fate of the child is bound up with that of the tree. If the tree shoots up rapidly, it will go well with the child, but if the tree is dwarfed or shriveled, nothing but misfortune can be expected for its human counterpart. It is said that there are still families in Russia, Germany, England, France, and Italy who are accustomed to plant a tree at the birth of a child. The tree, it is hoped, will grow with the child, and it is tended with special care. The custom is still pretty general in the canton of Argau in Switzerland. An apple tree is planted for a boy and a pear tree for a girl, and the people think that the child will flourish or dwindle with the tree. In Mecklenburg, the afterbirth is thrown out at the foot of a young tree, and the child is then believed to grow with the tree. Near the castle of Dalhousie, not far from Edinburgh, there grows an oak tree called the Edgewell tree, 
which is popularly believed to be linked to the fate of the family by a mysterious tie. For they say that when one of the family dies, or is about to die, a branch falls from the Edgewell tree. Thus, on seeing a great bough drop from the tree on a quiet still day in July 1874, an old forester exclaimed, the laird's dead, no! And soon after news came that Fox Mall, 11th Earl of Dalhousie, was dead. In England, children are sometimes passed through a cleft ash tree as a cure for rupture or rickets, and thenceforth a sympathetic connection is supposed to exist between them and the tree. An ash tree which had been used for this purpose grew at the edge of Shirley Heath, on the road from Hockley House to Birmingham. Thomas Chillingworth, son of the owner of an adjoining farm, now about thirty-four, was, when an infant of a year old, passed through a similar tree, now perfectly sound, which he preserves with so much care that he will not suffer a single branch to be touched, for it is believed that the life of the patient depends on the life of the tree, and the moment that is cut down, be the patient ever so distant, the rupture returns, and a mortification ensures and terminates in death, as was the case in a man driving a wagon on the very road in question. It is not uncommon, however, adds the writer, for a person to survive for a time the felling of the tree. The ordinary mode of effecting the cure is to split a young ash sapling longitudinally for a few feet and pass the child naked, either three times or three times three, through the fissure at sunrise. In the west of England, it is said that the passage should be against the sun. As soon as the ceremony has been performed, the tree is bound tightly up, and the fissure plastered over with mud or clay. The belief is that just as the cleft in the tree closes up, so the rupture in the child's body will be healed, but that if the rift in the tree remains open, the rupture in the child will remain too, and if the tree were to die, the death of the child would surely follow. A similar cure for various diseases, but especially for rupture and rickets, has been commonly practiced in other parts of Europe, in Germany, France, Denmark, and Sweden. But in these countries, the tree employed for the purpose is usually not an ash, but an oak. Sometimes a willow tree is allowed or even prescribed instead. In Mecklenburg, as in England, the sympathetic relation thus established between the tree and the child is believed to be so close that if the tree is cut down, the child will die. Subsection 3. The External Soul in Animals but in practice, as in folk tales, it is not merely with inanimate objects and plants that a person is occasionally believed to be united by a bond of physical sympathy. The same bond, it is supposed, may exist between a man and an animal, so that the welfare of the one depends on the welfare of the other, and when the animal dies, the man dies also. The analogy between the custom and the tales is all the closer, because in both of them, the power of thus removing the soul from the body and stowing it away in an animal is often a special privilege of wizards and witches. Thus, the Yakuts of Siberia believe that every shaman or wizard keeps his soul, or one of his souls, incarnate in an animal, which is carefully concealed from all the world. Nobody can find my external soul, said one famous wizard. It lies hidden far away in the stony mountains of Edzingansk. Only once a year, when the last snows melt and the earth turns black, do these external souls of wizards appear in the shape of animals among the dwellings of men. They wander everywhere, yet none but wizards can see them. The strong ones sweep roaring and noisily along, the weak steal about quietly and furtively. Often they fight, and then the wizard, whose external soul is beaten, falls ill or dies. The weakest and most cowardly wizards are they whose souls are incarnate in the shape of dogs, for the dog gives his human double no peace, but gnaws his heart and tears his body. The most powerful wizards are they whose external souls have the shape of stallions, elks, black bears, eagles, or boars. Again, the Samoyeds of the Turokinsk region hold that every shaman has a familiar spirit in the shape of a boar, which he leads about by a magic belt. On the death of the boar, the shaman himself dies, and stories are told of battles between wizards who send their spirits to fight before they encounter each other in person. The Malays believe that the soul of a person may pass into another person, or into an animal, or rather that such a mysterious relation can arise between the two that the fate of the one is wholly dependent on that of the other. Among the Melanesians of Mota, one of the New Hebrides islands, the conception of an external soul is carried out in the practice of daily life. In the Mota language, the word tamaniu signifies something animate or inanimate, which a man has come to believe, to have an existence intimately connected with his own. It was not everyone in Mota who had his tamaniu. Only some men fancied that they had this relation to a lizard, a snake, or it might be a stone. Sometimes the thing was sought for, and found by drinking the infusion of certain leaves, and heaping together the dregs. Then whatever living thing was first seen in or upon the heap was the tamaniu. 
It was watched, but not fed or worshipped. The natives believed that it came at call, and that the life of the man was bound up with the life of his tamaniu, if a living thing, or with its safety, should it die, or if not living, get broken, or be lost, the man would die. Hence, in case of sickness, they would send to see if the tamaniu was safe and well. The theory of an external soul deposited in an animal appears to be very prevalent in West Africa, particularly in Nigeria, the Cameroons, and the Gaboon. Among the fans of the Gaboon, every wizard is believed at initiation to unite his life with that of some particular wild animal by right of blood brotherhood. He draws blood from the ear of the animal and from his own arm, and inoculates the animal with his own blood and himself with the blood of the beast. Henceforth, such an intimate union is established between the two, that the death of the one entails the death of the other. The alliance is thought to bring to the wizard or sorcerer a great accession of power, which he can turn to his advantage in various ways. In the first place, like the warlock in the fairy tales who has deposited his life outside of himself in some safe place, the fan wizard now deems himself invulnerable. Moreover, the animal with which he has exchanged blood has become his familiar, and will obey any orders he may choose to give it. So, he makes use of it to injure and kill his enemies. For that reason, the creature with whom he establishes the relation of blood brotherhood is never a tame or domestic animal, but always a ferocious and dangerous wild beast, such as a leopard, a black serpent, a crocodile, a hippopotamus, a wild boar, or a vulture." Of all these creatures, the leopard is by far the commonest familiar of fan wizards, and next to it comes the black serpent. The vulture is the rarest. Witches, as well as wizards, have their familiars, but the animals with which the lives of women are thus bound up generally differ from those to which men commit their external souls. A witch never has a panther for her familiar, but often a venomous species of serpent, sometimes a horned viper, sometimes a black serpent, sometimes a green one that lives in banana trees, or it may be a vulture, an owl, or other bird of night. In every case, the beast or bird with which the witch or wizard has contracted this mystic alliance is an individual, never a species, and when the individual animal dies, the alliance is naturally at an end, since the death of the animal is supposed to entail the death of the man. Similar beliefs are held by the natives of the Cross River Valley within the provinces of the Cameroons. Groups of people, generally the inhabitants of a village, have chosen various animals with which they believe themselves to stand on a footing of intimate friendship or relationship. Among such animals are hippopotamuses, elephants, leopards, crocodiles, gorillas, fish, and serpents, all of them creatures which are either very strong or can easily hide themselves in the water or a thicket. This power of concealing themselves is said to be an indispensable condition of the choice of animal familiars, since the animal friend or helper is expected to injure his owner's enemy by stealth. For example, if he is a hippopotamus, he will bob up suddenly out of the water and capsize the enemy's canoe. Between the animals and their human friends or kinsfolk, such a sympathetic relation is supposed to exist that the moment the animal dies, the man dies also, and similarly, the instant the man perishes, so does the beast. From this it follows that the animal kinsfolk may never be shot at or molested for fear of injuring or killing the persons whose lives are knit up with the lives of the brutes. This does not, however, prevent the people of the village who have elephants for their animal friends from hunting elephants, for they do not respect the whole species but merely certain individuals of it, which stand in an intimate relation to certain individual men and women, and they imagine that they can always distinguish these brother elephants from the common herd of elephants, which are mere elephants and nothing more. The recognition indeed is said to be mutual. When a hunter who has an elephant for his friend meets a human elephant, as we may call it, the noble animal lifts up a paw and holds it before his face, as much as to say, don't shoot, were the hunter so inhumane as to fire on and wound such an elephant, the person whose life was bound up with the elephant would fall ill. The belong of the Cameroons think that every man has several souls, of which one is in his body and another in an animal, such as an elephant, a wild pig, a leopard, and so forth. When a man comes home feeling ill and says, I shall soon die, and dies accordingly, the people aver that one of his souls has been killed in a wild pig or a leopard, and that the death of the external soul has caused the death of the soul in his body. A similar belief in the external souls of living people is entertained by the Ibos, an important tribe of the Niger Delta. They think that a man's spirit can quit his body for a time during life and take up its abode in an animal. A man who wishes to acquire his power procures a certain drug from a wise man and mixes it with his food. After that, his soul goes out and enters into an animal. 
If it should happen that the animal is killed while the man's soul is lodged in it, the man dies. And if the animal be wounded, the man's body will presently be covered with boils. This belief instigates to many deeds of darkness, for a sly rogue will sometimes surreptitiously administer the magical drug to his enemy in his food, and having thus smuggled the other soul into an animal, will destroy the creature, and with it the man whose soul is lodged in it. The people of Calabar, at the mouth of the Niger, believe that every person has four souls, one of which always lives outside of his or her body in the form of a wild beast in the forest. This external soul, or bush soul, as Miss Kingsley calls it, may be almost any animal, for example, a leopard, a fish, or a tortoise, but it is never a domestic animal, and never a plant. Unless he is gifted with second sight, a man cannot see his own bush soul, but a diviner will often tell him that what sort of creature his bush soul is, and after that the man will be careful not to kill any animal of that species, and will strongly object to anyone else doing so. A man and his sons have usually the same sort of animals for their bush souls, and so with a mother and her daughters, but sometimes all the children of a family take after the bush soul of their father, for example. If this external soul is a leopard, all his sons and daughters will have leopards for their external souls, and on the other hand, sometimes they all take after their mother. For instance, if her external soul is a tortoise, all the external souls of her sons and daughters will be tortoises too. So intimately bound up is the life of the man with that of the animal which he regards as his external or bush soul, that the death or injury of the animal necessarily entails the death or injury of the man. And conversely, when the man dies, his bush soul can no longer find a place of rest, but goes mad and rushes into the fire or charges people and is knocked on the head, and that is an end of it. Near Eket, in North Calabar, there is a sacred lake, the fish of which are carefully preserved, because the people believe that their own souls are lodged in the fish, and that with every fish killed, a human life would be simultaneously extinguished. In the Calabar River, not very many years ago, there used to be a huge old crocodile popularly supposed to contain the external soul of a chief, who resided in the flesh at Duke Town, sporting vice consuls used from time to time to hunt the animal, and once an officer contrived to hit it, Forthwith, the chief was laid up with a wound in his leg. He gave out that a dog had bitten him, but no doubt the wise shook their heads and refused to be put off with so flimsy a pretext. Again, among several tribes on the banks of the Niger, between Lakoya and the Delta, there prevails a belief in the possibility of a man possessing an alter ego in the form of some animal, such as a crocodile or hippopotamus. It is believed that such a person's life is bound up with that of the animal to such an extent that whatever affects the one produces a corresponding impression upon the other, and that if one dies, the other must speedily do so too. It happened, not very long ago, that an Englishman shot a hippopotamus close to a native village. The friends of a woman who died the same night in the village demanded and eventually obtained five pounds as compensation for the murder of the woman. Amongst the Zapotecs of Central America, when a woman was about to be confined, her relations assembled in the hut and began to draw on the floor figures of different animals, rubbing each one out as soon as it was completed. This went on till the moment of birth, and the figure that then remained sketched upon the ground was called the child's tona, or second self. When the child grew old enough, he procured the animal that represented him, and took care of it, as it was believed that health and existence were bound up with that of the animals, in fact, that the death of both would occur simultaneously, or rather, that when the animal died, the man would die too. Among the Indians of Guatemala and Honduras, the Nagual, or Nual, is that animate or inanimate object, generally an animal, which stands in a parallel relation to a particular man, so that the weal and woe of the man depend on the fate of the Nagual. According to an old writer, many Indians of Guatemala are deluded by the devil to believe that their life dependeth upon the life of such and such a beast, which they take unto them as their familiar spirit and think that when the beast dieth, they must die, and when he is chaste, their hearts pant. When he is faint, they are faint. Nay, it happeneth, that by the devil's delusion they appear in the shape of that beast, which commonly by their choice is a buck, or doe, a lion, or tiger, or dog, or eagle, and in that shape they have been shot at and wounded. The Indians were persuaded that the death of their Nagual would entail their own. Legend affirms that in the first battles with the Spaniards on the plateau of Quetzaltenango, the Naguals of the Indian chiefs fought in the form of serpents. 
The nagual of the highest chief was especially conspicuous, because it had the form of a great bird, resplendent in green plumage. The Spanish general Pedro de Alvarado killed the bird with his lance, and at the same moment, the Indian chief fell dead to the ground. In many tribes of southeastern Australia, each sex used to regard a particular species of animal in the same way that a Central American Indian regarded his nagual, but with this difference that whereas the Indian apparently knew the individual animal with which his life was bound up, the Australians only knew that each of their lives was bound up with some one animal of the species, but they could not say with which. The result, naturally, was that every man spared and protected all the animals of the species with which the lives of the men were bound up, and every woman spared and protected all the animals of the species with which the lives of the women were bound up, because no one knew but that the death of any animal of the respective species might entail his or her own. Just as the killing of the green bird was immediately followed by the death of the Indian chief and the killing of the parrot by the death of Punchkin in the fairy tale. Thus, for example, the Wachabalic tribe of southeastern Australia held that the life of the Nunganunganut, the bat, is the life of a man, and the life of the Yartagurk, the nightjar, is the life of a woman, and that when either of these creatures is killed, the life of some man or of some woman is shortened. In such a case, every man or every woman in the camp feared that he or she might be the victim, and from this cause great fights arose in this tribe. I learned that in these fights, men on one side and women on the other, it was not at all certain which would be victorious, for at times the women gave the men a severe drubbing with their yam sticks, while often women were injured or killed by spears. The Wochabalik said that the bat was the man's brother, and that the nightjar was his wife. The particular species of animals, with which the lives of the sexes were believed to be respectively bound up, varied somewhat from tribe to tribe. Thus, whereas among the Wachabalik, the bat was the animal of the men, at Gunbower Creek, on the lower Murray, the bat seems to have been the animal of the women. For the natives would not kill it, for the reason that, if it was killed, one of their lubras, women, would be sure to die in consequence. But whatever the particular sorts of creature with which the lives of men and women were believed to be bound up, the belief itself and the fights to which it gave rise are known to have prevailed over a large part of southeastern Australia, and probably they extended much farther. The belief was a very serious one, and so consequently were the fights which sprang from it. Thus, among some tribes of Victoria, the common bat belongs to the men who protect it against injury, even to the half-killing of their wives for its sake. The fern owl, or large goat sucker, belongs to the women, and, although a bird of evil omen, creating terror at night by its cry, it is jealously protected by them. If a man kills one, they are as much enraged as if it was one of their children, and will strike him with their long poles. The jealous protection thus afforded by Australian men and women to bats and owls respectively, for bats and owls seem to be the creatures usually allotted to the two sexes, is not based upon purely selfish considerations. For each man believes that not only his own life, but the lives of his father, brothers, sons, and so on are bound up with the lives of particular bats, and that therefore in protecting the bat species, he is protecting the lives of all his male relations as well as his own. Similarly, each woman believes that the lives of her mother, sisters, daughters, and so forth, equally with her own, are bound up with the lives of particular owls, and that in guarding the owl species, she is guarding the lives of all her female relations besides her own. Now, when men's lives are thus supposed to be contained in certain animals, it is obvious that the animals can hardly be distinguished from the men, or the men from the animals. If my brother John's life is in a bat, then, on the one hand, the bat is my brother as well as John, and, on the other hand, John is in a sense a bat, since his life is in a bat. Similarly, if my sister Mary's life is in an owl, then the owl is my sister, and Mary is an owl. This is a natural enough conclusion, and the Australians have not failed to draw it. When the bat is the man's animal, it is called his brother, and when the owl is the woman's animal, it is called her sister. And conversely, a man addresses a woman as an owl, and she addresses him as a bat. So, with the other animals allotted to the sexes respectively in other tribes. For example, among the Kurnai, all emu wrens were brothers of the men, and all the men were emu wrens. All the superb warblers were sisters of the women, and all the women were superb warblers. But when a savage names himself after an animal, calls it his brother, and refuses to kill it, the animal is said to be his totem, 
accordingly in the tribes of southeastern Australia, which we have been considering the bat and the owl, the emu wren and the superb warbler may properly be described as totems of the sexes. But the assignation of a totem to a sex is comparatively rare and has hitherto been discovered nowhere but in Australia. Far more commonly, the totem is appropriated not by sex, but to a clan and is hereditary, either in the male or female line. The relation of an individual to the clan totem does not differ in kind from his relation to the sex totem. He will not kill it. He speaks of it as his brother, and he calls himself by its name. Now, if the relations are similar, the explanation which holds good of the one ought equally to hold good for the other. Therefore, the reason why clan revere particular species of animals or plants, for the clan totem may be a plant, and call themselves after it, would seem to be a belief that the life of each individual of the clan is bound up with some one animal or plant of the species, and that his or her death would be the consequence of killing that particular animal or destroying that particular plant. This explanation of totism squares very well with Sir George Gray's definition of totem or kobong in Western Australia. He says, a certain mysterious connection exists between a family and its kabong, so that a member of the family will never kill an animal of the species to which his kabong belongs, should he find it asleep. Indeed, he always kills it reluctantly, and never without affording it a chance to escape. This arises from the family belief that some one individual of the species is their nearest friend, to kill whom would be a great crime, and to be carefully avoided. Similarly, a native who has a vegetable for his kabong may not gather it under certain circumstances and at a particular period of the year. Here it will be observed that though each man spares all the animals or plants of the species, they are not all equally precious to him. Far from it. Out of the whole species, there is only one which is specially dear to him. But as he does not know which the dear one is, he is obliged to spare them all from fear of injuring the one. Again, this explanation of the clan totem harmonizes with the supposed effect of killing one of the totem species. One day, when the blacks killed a crow, three or four days afterwards, a bourgeois crow, i.e. a man of the crow clan, named Larry, died. He had been ailing for some days, but the killing of his wingong totem hastened his death. Here, the killing of the crow caused the death of the man of the crow clan, exactly as in the case of the sex totems, the killing of a bat causes the death of a bat man, or killing of an owl causes the death of an owl woman. Similarly, the killing of his nagual causes the death of a Central American Indian. The killing of his bush soul causes the death of a Calabar person. The killing of his tamanyu causes the death of a Banks Islander, and the killing of the animal in which his life is stowed away causes the death of the giant or warlock in the fairy tale. Thus it appears that the story, the giant who had no heart in his body, may perhaps furnish the key to the relation which is supposed to subsist between man and his totem. The totem, on this theory, is simply the receptacle in which a man keeps his life as Punchkin kept his life in a parrot, and Bidisari kept her soul in a golden fish. It is no valid objection to this view that when a savage has both a sex totem and a clan totem, his life must be bound up with two different animals, the death of either of which would entail his own. If a man has more vital places than one in his body, why the savage may think, should he not have more vital places than one outside it? Why, since he can put his life outside himself, should he not transfer one portion of it to one animal and another to another? The divisibility of life, or, to put it otherwise, the plurality of souls, as an idea suggested by many familiar facts, and has commended itself to philosophers like Plato, as well as to savages. It is only when the notion of a soul, from being a quasi-scientific hypothesis, becomes a theological dogma, that its unity and indivisibility are insisted upon as essential. The savage, unshackled by dogma, is free to explain the facts of life by the assumption of as many souls as he thinks necessary. Hence, for example, the Caribs supposed that there was one soul in the head, another in the heart, and other souls at all the places where an artery is felt pulsating. Some of the Hadatsa Indians explain the phenomena of gradual death when the extremities appear dead first by supposing that man has four souls, and that they quit the body not simultaneously, but one after the other, dissolution being only complete when all four have departed. Some of the Dayaks of Borneo and the Malays of the peninsula believe that every man has seven souls. The Alfors of Posso and Celebus are of opinion that he has three, 
the natives of Laos suppose that the body is the seat of 30 spirits, which reside in the hands, the feet, the mouth, the eyes, and so on. Hence, from the primitive point of view, it is perfectly possible that a savage should have one soul in his sex totem, another in his clan totem. However, as I have observed, sex totems have been found nowhere but in Australia. So, that as a rule, the savage who practices totism need not have more than one soul out of his body at a time. If this explanation of the totem as a receptacle in which a man keeps his soul or one of his souls is correct, we should expect to find some totemic people of whom it is expressly said that every man amongst them is believed to keep at least one soul permanently out of his body, and that the destruction of his external soul is supposed to entail the death of its owner. Such a people are the Bataks of Sumatra. The Bataks are divided into exogamous clans, Margus, with descent in the male line, and each clan is forbidden to eat the flesh of a particular animal. One clan may not eat the tiger, another the ape, another the crocodile, another the dog, another the cat, another the dove, another the white buffalo, and another the locust. The reason given by members of a clan for abstaining from the flesh of the particular animal is either that they are descended from animals of that species, and that their souls after death may transmigrate into the animals, or that they or their forefathers have been under certain obligations to the creatures. Sometimes, but not always, the clan bears the name of the animal. Thus, the Bataks have totism in full. But further, each Batak believes that he has seven, or, on a more moderate computation, three souls. One of these souls is always outside the body, but nevertheless, whenever it dies, however far away it may be at the time, that some moment the man dies also. The writer who mentions this belief says nothing about the Batak totems, but on the analogy of the Australian, Central American, and African evidence, we may conjecture that the external soul, whose death entails the death of the man, is housed in the totemic animal or plant. Against this view, it can hardly be thought to militate that the Batak does not in set terms affirm his external soul to be in his totem, but alleges other grounds for respecting the sacred animal or plant of his clan. For if a savage seriously believes that his life is bound up with an external object, it is in the last degree unlikely that he will let any stranger into the secret. In all that touches his inmost life and beliefs, the savage is exceedingly suspicious and reserved. Europeans have resided among savages for years without discovering some of their capital articles of faith, and in the end, the discovery has often been the result of accident. Above all, the savage lives in an intense and perpetual dread of assassination by sorcery, the most trifling relics of his person, the clippings of his hair and nails, his spittle and remnants of his blood, his very name, all these may, he fancies, be turned by the sorcerer into his destruction, and he is therefore anxiously careful to conceal or destroy them. But if in matters such as these, which are but the outposts and outworks of his life, he is so shy and secretive, how close must be the concealment, how impenetrable the reserve in which he enshrouds the inner keep and citadel of his being. When the princess in the fairy tale asks the giant where he keeps his soul, he often gives false or evasive answers, and it is only after much coaxing and wheedling that the secret is at last wrung from him. In his jealous reticence, the giant resembles the timid and furtive savage, but whereas the exigencies of the story demand that the giant should at last reveal his secret, no such obligation is laid on the savage, and no inducement that can be offered is likely to tempt him to imperil his soul by revealing his hiding place to a stranger. It is therefore no matter for surprise that the central mystery of the savage's life should so long have remained a secret, and that we should be left to piece it together from scattered hints and fragments, and from the recollections of it which linger in fairy tales. Subsection 4. The Ritual of Death and Resurrection This view of totism throws light on a class of religious rites, of which no adequate explanation, so far as I am aware, has yet been offered. Amongst many savage tribes, especially such as are known to practice totism, it is customary for lads of puberty to undergo certain initiatory rites, of which one of the commonest is a pretense of killing the lad and bringing him to life again. Such rites become intelligible if we suppose that their substance consists in extracting the youth's soul in order to transfer it to his totem. For the extraction of his soul would naturally be supposed to kill the youth, or at least to throw him into a death-like trance, which the savage hardly distinguishes from death. His recovery would then then be attributed either to the gradual recovery of his system from the violent shock which it had received, or, more probably, to the infusion into him of fresh life drawn from the totem. 
thus the essence of these initiatory rites, so far as they consist in a simulation of death and resurrection, would be an exchange of life or souls between the man and his totem. The primitive belief in the possibility of such an exchange of souls comes clearly out in a story of a Basque hunter who affirmed that he had been killed by a bear, but that the bear had, after killing him, breathed its own soul into him, so that the bear's body was now dead, but he himself was a bear, being animated by the bear's soul. This revival of the dead hunter as a bear is exactly analogous to what, on the theory here suggested, is supposed to take place in the ceremony of killing a lad at puberty and bringing him to life again. The lad dies as a man and comes to life again as an animal. The animal's soul is now in him, and his human soul is in the animal. With good right, therefore, does he call himself a bear or a wolf, etc., according to his totem. And with good right does he treat the bears or the wolves, etc., as his brethren, since in these animals are lodged the souls of himself and his kindred. Examples of this supposed death and resurrection at initiation are as follows. In the Wangi or Wangabon tribe of New South Wales, the youths on approaching manhood are initiated at a secret ceremony, which none but initiated men may witness. Part of the proceedings consists in knocking out a tooth and giving a new name to the novice, indicative of the change from youth to manhood. While the teeth are being knocked out, an instrument known as a bull roarer, which consists of a flat piece of wood with serrated edges tied to the end of a string, is swung round so as to produce a loud humming noise. The uninitiated are not allowed to see this instrument. Women are forbidden to witness the ceremonies under pain of death. It is given out that the youths are each met in turn by a mythical being called the Remlin, more commonly known as Daramulin, who takes the youth to a distance, kills him, and in some instances cuts him up, after which he restores him to life and knocks out a tooth. Their belief in the power of the Remlin is said to be undoubted. The Uilaroi of the Upper Darling River said that at initiation the boy met a ghost, who killed him and brought him to life again as a young man. Among the natives on the Lower Lachlan and Murray Rivers, it was Thrumalan, Daramulin, who was thought to slay and resuscitate the novices. In the Yumatyara tribe of Central Australia, women and children believe a spirit called Twanyarika kills the youth and afterwards brings him to life again during the period of initiation. The rites of initiation in this tribe, as in the other central tribes, comprise the operations of circumcision and subincision, and as soon as the second of these has been performed on him, the young man receives from his father a sacred stick, Turinga with which he is told his spirit was associated in the remotest past. While he is out in the bush recovering from his wounds, he must swing the bull roarer, or a being who lives up in the sky will swoop down and carry him off. In the Bimbinga tribe on the western coast of the Gulf of Carpentaria, the women and children believe that the noise of the bull roarer at initiation is made by a spirit named Katahalina, who lives in an anthill and comes out and eats up the boy, afterwards restoring him to life. Similarly, among their neighbors, the Nula the women imagine that the droning sound of the bull roar is produced by a spirit called Nabaya, who swallows the lads at initiation and afterwards disgorges them in the form of initiated men. Among the tribes settled on the southern coast of New Wales, of which the Coast Murring tribe may be regarded as typical, the drama of resurrection from the dead was exhibited in a graphic form to the novices at initiation. The ceremony has been described for us by an eyewitness, a man disguised with stringy bark fiber, lay down in a grave and was lightly covered up with sticks and earth. In his hand he held a small bush, which appeared to be growing in the soil, and other bushes were stuck in the ground to heighten the effect. Then the novices were brought and placed beside the grave. Next, a procession of men, disguised in stringy bark fiber, drew near. They represented a party of medicine men, guided by two reverend seniors, who had come on pilgrimage to the grave of a brother medicine man, who lay buried there. When the little procession, chanting an invocation to Dara Mullen, had defiled from among the rocks and trees into the open, it drew up on the side of the grave opposite to the novices, the two old men taking up a position in the rear of the dancers. For some time the dance and song went on till the tree that seemed to grow from the grave began to quiver. "'Look there!' cried the men to the novices, pointing to the trembling leaves. As they looked, the tree quivered more and more, then was violently agitated and fell to the ground, while amid the excited dancing of the dancers and the chanting of the choir, the supposed dead man spurned from him the superincumbent mass of sticks and leaves, and springing to his feet, danced his magical dance in the grave itself, and exhibited in his mouth the magic substances which he was supposed to have received from Dara Mullen in person.' Some tribes of northern New Guinea, the Yabim, 
Bukawa, Kai, and Tami, like many Australian tribes, require every male member of the tribe to be circumcised before he ranks as a full-grown man. And the tribal initiation, of which circumcision is the central feature, is conceived by them, as by some Australian tribes, as a process of being swallowed and disgorged by a mythical monster, whose voice is heard in the humming sound of the bull roarer. Indeed, the New Guinea tribes not only impress this belief on the minds of women and children, but enacted in a dramatic form at the actual rites of initiation, at which no woman or uninitiated person may be present. For this purpose, a hut about a hundred feet long is erected either in the village or in a lonely part of the forest. It is modeled in the shape of the mythical monster. At the end, which represents his head, it is high, and it tapers away at the other end. A betel palm grubbed up with the roots stands for the backbone of the great being and its clustering fibers for his hair. And to complete the resemblance, the butt end of the building is adorned by a native artist with a pair of goggle eyes and a gaping mouth. When after a tearful parting from their monsters and womenfolk, who believe or pretend to believe in the monster that swallows their dear ones, the awestruck novices are brought face to face with this imposing structure. The huge creature emits a sullen growl, which is in fact no other than the humming note of bull roars swung by a man concealed in the monster's belly. The actual process of deglutition is variously enacted. Among the Tami, it is represented by causing the candidates to defile past a row of men who hold bull roars over their heads. Among the Kai, it is more graphically set forth by making them pass under a scaffold on which stands a man who makes a gesture of swallowing and takes, in fact, a gulp of water as each trembling novice passes beneath him. But the present of a pig, opportunely offered for the redemption of the youth, induces the monster to relent and disgorge his victim. The man who represents the monster accepts the gift vicariously. A gurgling sound is heard, and the water, which had just been swallowed, descends in a jet on the novice. This signifies that the young man has been released from the monster's belly. However, he has now to undergo the more painful and dangerous operation of circumcision. It follows immediately, and the cut made by the knife of the operator is explained to be a bite or scratch, which the monster inflicted on the novice in spewing him out of his capacious maw. While the operation is proceeding, a prodigious noise is made by the swinging of bull roars to represent the roar of the dreadful being who is in the act of swallowing the young man. When, as sometimes happens, a lad dies from the effect of the operation, he is buried secretly in the forest, and his sorrowing mother is told that the monster has a pig's stomach as well as a human stomach, and that unfortunately her son slipped into the wrong stomach from which it was impossible to extricate him. After they have been circumcised, the lads must remain for some months in seclusion, shunning all contact with women and even the sight of them. They live in the long hut which represents the monster's belly, when at last the lads, now ranking as initiated men, are brought back with great pomp and ceremony to the village. They are received with sobs and tears of joy by the women, as if the grave had given up its dead. At first, the young men keep their eyes rigidly closed or even sealed with a plaster of chalk, and they appear not to understand the words of command which are given them by an elder. Gradually, however, they come to themselves as if awakening from a stupor, and next day they bathe and wash off the crust of white chalk with which their bodies had been coated. It is highly significant that all these tribes of New Guinea apply the same word to the bull roarer and to the monster, who is supposed to swallow the novices at circumcision, and whose fearful roar is represented by the hum of the harmless wooden instruments. Further, it deserves to be noted that in three languages out of the four, the same word which is applied to the bull roarer and to the monster means also a ghost or spirit of the dead, while in the fourth language, the Kai, it signifies grandfather. From this, it seems to follow that the being who swallows and disgorges the novices at initiation is believed to be a powerful ghost or ancestral spirit, and that the bull roarer, which bears his name, is his material representative. That would explain the jealous secrecy with which the sacred implement is kept from the sight of women. While they are not in use, the bull roarers are stowed away in the men's clubhouses, which no woman may enter. Indeed, no woman or uninitiated person may set their eyes on a bull roarer under pain of death. Similarly, among the Tugari, or Kaya Kaya, a large Papuan tribe on the south coast of Dutch New Guinea, the name of the bull roarer, which they call Sosam, is given to a mythical giant, who is supposed to appear every year with the southeast monsoon. When he comes, a festival is held in his honor, and bull roarers are swung. Boys are presented to the giant, and he kills them, but considerately brings them to life again. In certain districts of Vitu Lavu, 
the largest of the Fijian islands. The drama of death and resurrection used to be acted with such solemnity before the eyes of young men at initiation. In a sacred enclosure, they were shown a row of dead or seemingly dead men lying on the ground, their bodies cut open and covered with blood, their entrails protruding. But at a yell from the high priest, the counterfeit dead men started to their feet and ran down to the river to cleanse themselves from the blood and guts of pigs with which they were beslobbered. Soon they marched back to the sacred enclosure, as if come to life, clean, fresh, and garlanded, swaying their bodies in time to the music of a solemn hymn, and took their places in front of the novices. Such was the drama of death and resurrection. The people of Rook, an island between New Guinea and New Britain, holds festivals at which one or two disguised men, their heads covered with wooden masks, go dancing through the village, followed by all the other men. They demand that the circumcised boys, who have not yet been swallowed by Marsaba, the devil, shall be given up to them. The boys, trembling and shrieking, are delivered to them, and must creep between the legs of the disguised men. Then the procession moves through the village again and announces that Marsaba has eaten up the boys and will not disgorge them till he receives a present of pigs, taro, and so forth. So all the villagers, according to their means, contribute provisions, which are then consumed in the name of Marsaba. In the west of Saram, boys at puberty are admitted to the Kakian Association. Modern writers have commonly regarded this association as primarily a political league instituted to resist foreign domination. In reality, its objects are purely religious and social, though it is possible that the priests may have occasionally used their powerful influence for political ends. The society is in fact merely one of those widely diffused primitive institutions of which a chief object is the initiation of young men. In recent years, the true nature of the association has been duly recognized by the distinguished Dutch ethnologist J. G. F. Rydell. The Kakian house is an oblong wooden shed situated under the darkest tree in the depth of the forest and is built to admit so little light that it is impossible to see what goes on in it. Every village has such a house. Thither the boys who are to be initiated are conducted blindfold, followed by their parents and relations. Each boy is led by the hand of two men, who act as his sponsors or guardians, looking after him during the period of initiation. When all are assembled before the shed, the high priest calls aloud upon the devils. Immediately a hideous uproar is heard to proceed from the shed. It is made by men with bamboo trumpets, who have been secretly introduced into the building by a back door, but the women and children think it is made by the devils, and are much terrified. Then the priests enter the shed, followed by the boys one at a time. As soon as each boy has disappeared within the precincts, a dull chopping sound is heard, a fearful cry rings out, and a sword or spear dripping with blood is thrust through the roof of the shed. This is a token that the boy's head has been cut off, and that the devil has carried him away to the other world, there to regenerate and transform him. So at sight of the bloody sword, the mothers weep and wail, crying that the devil has murdered their children. In some places, it would seem, the boys are pushed through an opening made in the shape of a crocodile's jaws or a cassowary's beak, and it is then said that the devil has swallowed them. The boys remain in the shed for five or nine days. Sitting in the dark, they hear the blast of the bamboo trumpets, and from time to time the sound of musket shots and the clash of swords. Every day they bathe, and their faces and bodies are smeared with a yellow dye to give them the appearance of having been swallowed by the devil. During his stay in the Kikayan house, each boy has one or two crosses tattooed with horns on his breast or arm. When they are not sleeping, the lads must sit in a crouching posture without moving a muscle. As they sit in a row cross-legged and their hands stretched out, the chief takes his trumpet and placing the mouth of it on the hands of each lad, speaks through it in strange tones, imitating the voice of the spirits. He warns the lads under pain of death to observe the rules of the Kakaian society and never to reveal what has passed in the Kakaian house. The novices are also told by the priest to behave well to their blood relations and are taught the traditions and secrets of the tribe. Meantime, the mothers and sisters of the lads have gone home to weep and mourn, but in a day or two the men who acted as guardians or sponsors to the novices return to the village with the glad tidings that the devil, at the intercession of the priests, has restored the lads to life. The men who bring this news come in a fainting state and daubed with mud, like messengers freshly arrived from the netherworld. Before leaving the Kakayan house, each lad receives from the priest a stick adorned at both ends with a cock or a cassowary's feathers. The sticks are supposed to have been given to the lads by the devil at the time when he restored them to life, and they serve as a token that the youths have been in the spirit land. When they return to their homes, they totter in their walk and enter the house backward. 
as if they had forgotten how to walk properly, or they enter the house by the back door. If a plate of food is given to them, they hold it upside down. They remain dumb, indicating their wants by signs only. All this is to show that they are still under the influence of the devil or the spirits. Their sponsors have to teach them all the common acts of life, as if they were newborn children. Further, upon leaving the Kakayan house, the boys are strictly forbidden to eat of certain fruits until the next celebration of the rites has taken place, and for twenty or thirty days, their hair may not be combed by their mothers or sisters. At the end of the time, the high priest takes them to a lonely place in the forest and cuts off a lock of hair from the crown of each of their heads. After these initiatory rites, the lads are deemed men and may marry. It would be a scandal if they married before. In the region of the Lower Congo, a simulation of death and resurrection is, or rather used to be, practiced by the members of a guild or secret society called Lembo. In the practice of Lembo, the initiating doctors get someone to fall down in a pretend fit, and in that state, he's carried away to an enclosed place outside the town. This is called Dying Dembo. Others follow suit, generally boys and girls, but often young men and women. They are supposed to have died, but the parents and friends supply food, and after a period, varying according to custom, from three months to three years, it is arranged that the doctor shall bring them to life again. When the doctor's fee has been paid, the money, goods, saved for a feast, the Dembo people are brought to life. At first, they pretend to know no one and nothing. They do not even know how to masticate food, and friends have to perform that office for them. They want anything nice that any one uninitiated may have, and beat them if it is not granted, or even strangle and kill people. They do not get into trouble for this, because it is thought that they do not know better. Sometimes they carry on the pretense of talking gibberish, and behaving as if they had returned from the spirit world. After this, they are known by another name, peculiar to those who have died no we hear of a custom far along on the upper river as well as in the cataract region among some of the indian tribes of north america there exist certain religious associations which are only open to candidates who have gone through a pretense of being killed and brought to life again in 1766 or 1767, Captain Jonathan Carver witnessed the admission of a candidate to an association called the Friendly Society of the Spirit, Wakan Kichewa, among the Nautoasis, a Siouan or Dakotan tribe in the region of the Great Lakes. The candidate knelt before the chief, who told him that he himself was now agitated by the same spirit, which he should in a few moments communicate to him that it would strike him dead, but that he would instantly be restored again to life. To this, he added that the communication, however terrifying, was a necessary introduction to the advantages enjoyed by the community into which he was on the point of being admitted. As he spoke this, he appeared to be greatly agitated, till at last his emotions became so violent that his countenance was distorted and his whole frame convulsed. At this juncture, he threw something that appeared both in shape and color, like a small bean, at the young man, which seemed to enter his mouth, and he instantly fell as motionless as if he had been shot. For a time, the man lay like dead, but under a shower of blows, he showed signs of consciousness, and finally, discharging from his mouth the bean or whatever it was that the chief had thrown at him, he came to life. In other tribes, for example, the Jibbeways, Winnebagos and Dakotas or Sioux, the instrument by which the candidate is apparently slain is the medicine bag. The bag is made of the skin of an animal, such as the otter, wild cat, serpent, bear, raccoon, wolf, owl, weasel, of which it roughly preserves the shape. Each member of the society has one of these bags, in which he keeps the odds and ends that make up his medicine or charms. They believe that from the miscellaneous contents in the belly of the skin bag or animal, there issues a spirit or breath, which has the power not only to knock down and kill a man, but also to set him up and restore him to life. The mode of killing a man with one of these medicine bags is to thrust it at him. He falls like dead, but a second thrust of the bag restores him to life. A ceremony witnessed by the castaway John R. Jewett during his captivity among the Indians of Nuka Sound doubtless belongs to this class of customs. The Indian king or chief discharged a pistol close to his son's ear, who immediately fell down as if killed, upon which all the women of the house set up a most lamentable cry, tearing handfuls of hair from their heads and exclaiming that the prince was dead. 
At the same time, a great number of the inhabitants rushed into the house armed with their daggers, muskets, etc., inquiring the cause of their outcry. These were immediately followed by two others dressed in wolfskins, with masks over their faces representing the head of that animal. The latter came in on their hands and feet in the manner of a beast, and taking up the prince, carried him off upon their backs, retiring in the same manner they entered. In another place, Dewitt mentions that the young prince, a lad of about eleven years of age, wore a mask in imitation of a wolf's head. Now, as the Indians of this part of America are divided into totem clans, of which the wolf clan is one of the principal and as the members of each clan are in the habit of wearing some portion of the totem animal about their person it is probable that the prince belonged to the wolf clan and that the ceremony described by jewett represented the killing of the lad in order that he might be born anew as a wolf much in the same way that the basque hunter supposed himself to have been killed and to have come to life again as a bear this conjectural explanation of the ceremony has since it was first put forward been to some extent confirmed by the researches of dr franz boas among these indians though it would seem that the community to which the chief's son thus obtained admission was not so much a totem clan as a secret society called tlacola whose members imitated wolves every new member of the society must be initiated by the wolves at night a pack of wolves personated by indians dressed in wolf skins and wearing wolf masks make their appearance seize the novice and carry him into the woods when the wolves are heard outside the village coming to fetch away the novice all the members of the society blacken their faces and sing among all the tribes is great excitement because i am tlokola next day the wolves bring back the novice dead and the members of the society have to revive him the wolves are supposed to have put a magic stone into his body which must be removed before he can come to life till this is done the pretended corpse is left lying outside the house two wizards go and remove the stone which appears to be quartz and then the novice is resuscitated among the niska indians of british columbia who are divided into four principal clans with the raven the wolf the eagle and the bear for their respective totems the novice at initiation is always brought back by an artificial totem animal thus when a man was about to be initiated into a secret society called olala his friends drew their knives and pretended to kill him in reality they let him slip away while they cut off the head of a dummy which had been adroitly substituted for him then they laid the decapitated dummy down and covered it over and the women began to mourn and wail his relations gave a funeral banquet and solemnly burnt the effigy in short they held a regular funeral for a whole year the novice remained absent and was seen by none but members of the secret society but at the end of that time he came back alive carried by an artificial animal which represented his totem in these ceremonies the essence of the rite appears to be the killing of the novice in his character of a man and his restoration to life in the form of the animal which is thenceforward to be if not his guardian spirit at least linked to him in a peculiarly intimate relation it is to be remembered that the indians of guatemala whose life was bound up with an animal were supposed to have the power of appearing in the shape of the particular creature with which they were thus sympathetically united hence it seems not unreasonable to conjecture that in like manner the indians of british columbia may imagine that their life depends on the life of some one of that species of creature to which they assimilate themselves by their costume at least if that is not an article of belief with the columbian indians of the present day it may very well have been so with their ancestors in the past and thus may have helped to mold the rites and ceremonies both of the totem clans and of the secret societies for though these sorts of communities differ in respect of the mode in which membership of them is obtained a man being born into his totem clan but admitted into the secret society later in life we can hardly doubt that they are near akin and have their root in the same mode of thought that thought if i am right is the possibility of establishing a sympathetic relation with an animal a spirit or other mighty being with whom a man deposits for safe keeping his soul or some part of it and from whom he receives in return a gift of magical powers thus on the theory here suggested wherever totism is found and wherever a pretense is made of killing and bringing to life again the novice at initiation there may exist or have existed not only a belief in the possibility of permanently depositing the soul in some external object animal plant or what not but an actual intention of so doing if the question is put why do men desire to deposit their life outside their bodies the answer can only be that like the giant in the fairy tale they think it safer to do so than to carry it about with them just as people deposit their money with a banker rather than carry it on their persons 
We have seen that at critical periods, the life or soul is sometimes temporarily stowed away in a safe place till the danger is past. But institutions like totism are not resorted to merely on special occasions of danger. They are systems into which everyone, or at least every male, is obliged to be initiated at a certain period of life. Now, the period of life at which initiation takes place is regularly puberty, and this fact suggests that the special danger which totism and systems like it are intended to obviate is supposed not to arise till sexual maturity has been attained. In fact, that the danger apprehended is believed to attend the relation of the sexes to each other. It would be easy to prove by a long array of facts that the sexual relation is associated in the primitive mind with many serious perils but the exact nature of the danger apprehended is still obscure. We may hope that the more exact acquaintance with savage modes of thought will in time disclose the central mystery of primitive society, and will thereby furnish the clue not only to totism, but to the origin of the marriage system. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. We will be back in two weeks with our next installment. In the meantime, you can catch up with our other pod, Midwest Covencast. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on our Patreon to gain access to additional content and exclusive Coven merch. You can even join our Coven by following us on social media at Midwest Covencast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. You can also keep up with us on our website, MidwestCovenCast.com. Until next time, Coven, blessed be.